have your Bibles with you. I'll preach till my voice runs out and then I'll be done. I better not say that because I've seen my voice last on the last leg for quite a while. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, open your Bibles to the book of Genesis. Can't wait for that land, Brother David. Walking in the back. You get used to you get used to seeing people places. And it don't hit you. It don't hit you when they're gone until you go to where you last saw them. And it hits you like a hammer. And I thank God, but I don't, I have no reason. I have nothing in me when I say funny stuff like that, that I'm a preaching machine. I have nothing in me that's braggadocious about it. It's what the Lord's given me. It's what the Lord's done for me. If it would have been me, I stepped away when I was around 19 years old. And I almost Almost got to a point where I couldn't come back from. And the Lord brought me back. He didn't let me get to that point. And uh, we're sitting in a time now, and I'm sad to say it, but we're sitting in a time where preachers no longer like to preach. We're sitting in a time and age where it's okay to send a missionary to the mission field that has no clue how to preach because he's going over there to teach people. It's not biblical, but that's what we say. Missionaries are just pastors that go overseas. Or it should be. Should be. They should be able to be apt to preach, teach, do everything that a pastor does back here at home. But we live in a time when the Elijah, the Elijahs have been passing on. COVID took a lot of Elijahs out of this world. COVID pulled a lot of men of God. Brother Dean always said it was a coronation. It was a year of coronations. I can think of very few. In fact, y'all may correct me. And, uh, and it's just because I'm not thinking about it good this morning. Um, but y'all can correct me, but the only, the only preacher of age that I can think of this morning is Brother James Langston. And he's just too ornery to die. <laughs> he's just going to keep going. I think, I think he told God, I'm going to this rapture and you ain't going to stop me. I don't know. But, uh, but I look at all these other men passing on, and I see them as Elijah, and I see us, Brother James, as Elisha. When did Elisha become Elijah? When did Joshua become Moses? And, uh, oh, man, folks are, folks are waiting around for their ministry when there's so many ministries to be had. And the world's falling apart. And preachers that are called, that are God called to preach, are giving up on preaching. They've gone to teaching. They've gone to this contemporary movement junk that has no bearing in the church. It has no bearing in the bride. The bride's to be pure. And all that contemporary and charismatic music is, is pure carnality. It's pure sensuality. But I just want to say this morning that I'm glad that God raised me up in a household that I was taught to preach from a young age. I was taught that it's the power of preaching that converts the lost. And it never says the power of teaching. You must be apt to teach those that got saved, but the preaching is what's going to get them in. And folks, I want to encourage you this morning. Y'all stay, y'all stay steady. Y'all stay strong. It's an amazing thing to watch a church outlive its preacher. It's an amazing thing. It don't happen often, and y'all have, and that's a beautiful thing. Book of Genesis, chapter twelve. Got to talking and lost my notes. <clears throat> Book of Genesis, chapter twelve. Start of Abram's ministry. We could almost picture him as the first missionary. If you if you take missions and break it down, missions has become political. I mean, it, it's become really political. We've talked about it, preacher. And the thing about missions is that in the Bible, it's kind of like the rapture. You'll never see the word missions. Well, where does it come from? It comes from the Catholics. It comes from the Catholic Church starting little missions out west, down in Mexico, all through the Indian nations when the world was when our world was still considered the new world. 
And it started there. And so we adapted it and modernized it. And now we're missionaries sent out of Lighthouse Baptist Church, sent out of Resurrection Baptist Church, sent out to go all over the world and preach the gospel. Now, the concept is there biblically, and we've chosen to call it mission, so I understand it. But, folks, I, wanna, I want you to picture missionaries from now on, if it's possible, as evangelists and pastors, because that's what we are, biblically speaking. We are bishops, and we are pastors over God's flock. And that's important to what I'm going to preach this morning. Um, but we live in a time and day where missionary, evangelists, pastors, we're in a, we're in a classism, uh, I don't even know what to call it, but a tier system. And uh, I still haven't been preaching in English that long, so sometimes I get stuck in my Spanish trying to translate it back into English and then figure out what I originally thought in Spanish because I saw something fly by. And, and it, it's hard, folks, but I'll get it here in a minute. But we're in a tier system that makes no sense. God called you here. God called me there. God called us all the different places. And just like Abraham, it's important not what your ministry is, but it's important to do exactly what God called you to do. And with Abraham, it wasn't to go out and win the masses. With Abraham, it was to have the masses. Out of him came all of the nations that we see nowadays in the Middle East. Out of him comes the Christian faith. And so I want to take this morning, and I want to read chapter 12. We're going to read verse 1 to see the call, and we're going to read verses 7 through 9. Uh, to see some details. And then we're going to read 13, 1 through 5. Brother, I'm really not used to coat jackets and stuff, so I'm going to kick this off. Oh, yeah. Well, I always, I always wear the tie because I can't stand these liberals that have lost the ties. But uh, I hate the tie, too, but I'll wear it just to just to put one on them. That's the only reason. I hate ties, but I'm going I'm to wear it till the liberals say, wear a tie, and then I'm going to leave the tie immediately. <laughs> The book of Genesis, chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Skip on down to verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram, and said, Unto thy seed, Will I give this land? And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Who did he build the altar to? Unto the Lord that had appeared unto him. Unto the Lord, there it's capitalized, unto the Lord Jehovah, the God of heaven and earth, the God back there in Genesis that had appeared unto Abram back in Ur of the Chaldees and had reappeared in this scripture right here. Now notice, and he removed, he keeps traveling because he hasn't made it to where God has called him yet. He keeps traveling on because he's not to the place that God has called him to go to. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. You notice in, in, these, in, these, in this passage, Abram begins to travel. The first thing he does when he gets to a place is he builds an altar. The next place he moves to, he builds an altar. He moves his tent. He moves his flocks. He builds a new altar. It's interesting. I've often thought uh, about building a little altar that I could I could pour it around with me. In fact, I've said it a couple of times. I'm going to build me an altar on wheels. But I've left that idea because it is the idea, the concept that I see in Abram's life is a new altar with new stones out of the place that God had given him the victory. That's why when they crossed Jordan, they pulled the stones up out of the Jordan to show where the Lord had given them victory. It was in the crossing. It wasn't on the edges. It was in the crossing that the Lord had given them victory. And it's an amazing thing. The only the only rule that we have in Scripture of altars is that there should be no tool of iron pass upon the stone so that the Israelites would not make graven images. But yet still we see names imposed upon these altars, whether it was a plaque put upon them, whether whether there was whether there was a, a, a namesake in Israel that everybody just knew what that altar was. There was always a, a name for the altar. Abram, when he went uh, Abraham, when he went up to offer Isaac on Mount Moriah, Jehovah Jireh was the name of that place. The Lord has provided the Lord provided a sacrifice. Uh, Exodus 17. Uh, if you read the end of it, I believe it's first. Verses 8 through 16, you'll find Jehovah Nisi. 
Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our banner, when he stood up on the hill and held nothing to show a banner, but he knew that God was above him and was worshiping his banner, and that's what gave him the victory. These altars, we view them in our modern day, in our modern technology, and we view them as old-fashioned. We view them as an Old Testament scripture, and nobody in this modern day and age, and I say nobody in a very general form, I know people that do, but nobody believes, nobody uh, is inspired to build rock altars anymore. It's an interesting fact. We always think metaphorically when we talk about the altar. Well, I've got a little altar beside my bed. Well, I've got a little altar in my closet. And there's some folks that have built wooden altars that have built little places to pray. Uh, Percy Ray had a bench that he laid out on. It had two horns on the front, two horns on the back, and it was made out of metal. And the reason he did was because he didn't want to fall asleep while he was praying because he would pray such massive times upon the altar that he had built to his God. And this is the same way with Abraham. You see him get to a place, to a new place, and he builds another altar. We have not been commanded to, to stop this practice in Scripture. But I want to take another man, and it's right here in this same Scripture, and notice that Lot left with Abraham. We all know the story. I'm not telling you anything new, but I want to take 13, 1 through 5. And I want to notice the difference between Lot and Abraham. Notice there, when Abraham gets done building that altar between Bethel and Ai, he slips up, he goes down to Egypt where he shouldn't be. It wasn't the place where the Lord called him. He went down to where he shouldn't be. He has a failure. He makes a massive mistake. What does he do in chapter 13? One? And Abraham went up out of Egypt he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. And Abraham was a very rich man in cattle and silver and in gold, and he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. Notice, it wasn't about where his tent had been, it was about where the altar was. Unto the place of the altar which he had made there at first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord, and Lot also, which went with Abram, notice, had flocks, had herds, had tents. He didn't have no altars. Let's pray this morning. Ask the Lord to to move amongst us. Let's pray and ask the Lord to convict our spirits this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. Lord, knowing that I am nobody and nothing to be in this place. God, so grateful for this church. So grateful for the years and years of friendship that we have in this place, God, and grateful that you've been able to bring us back and grateful for the blessings that you have imposed upon us this morning, God. Lord, help us as we preach that your power will be revealed and that our hearts will be convicted to a place where we can get back to where you need us, Lord, to where you want us, to where we can serve you better. Lord, if there be anybody here that's lost, Lord, save them before it's eternally too late. If there be anybody here, Lord, this way, we'd bring them back so that they can truly serve you. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We see these two We see these two characters. We see these two uh, uh, people in our history as, as human history. And we see Abram. He goes down into Egypt, and Egypt is the first place where he doesn't build an altar. The only other place that I find that he didn't build an altar, that he didn't really build an altar, or that he wasn't living at his altar was over there when Abimelech invited him down into the land of the Philistines. Now, in both cases, it's real interesting. Both cases are are enemies of God. Both cases are enemies of the children of God. In both cases, these are places that symbolize either the world or the flesh. And when Abraham got caught up in himself, he went places where he shouldn't go, did things that he shouldn't do, and got away from the altar of God. But it's interesting because as soon as Abraham would realize in himself the, the thing that was happening to him, When God would convict Abraham or convict the king that was trying uh, uh, to to form a relationship with Abraham's wife that he believed was Abraham's sister, the Bible says that as soon as Abraham would leave these places, he would go back to the place where he had builded an altar to the Lord. There are so many times as Christians that we need to get back to our altars, amen? We need to get back to the place where we called on God. We need to have a place that we can get back to when in utter failure we misstep out of God's will and out of God's plan. It is amazing to me that Abraham always had this. Lot, on the other hand, 
It said he had flocks, he had herds, and he, he had a tent. But the only altar that you'll ever find in Lot's life, and you study it all the way out, the only altar you'll ever hear of with Lot is the altar of Uncle Abram. It's an amazing thing that we live in a time and a place where the new generation that's coming up, and I'm talking about my age, not the people that are after me. I'm talking about my age. There is no more altars in our homes. There is no more altars in our churches. There is platforms nowadays. They build the platform so that the preacher can preach from a higher place, and they've taken out the altars that once were strewn amongst our pews. There was a time and a place where it wasn't just the place of the altar. There was also prayer benches. There was also a different, different churches had different methods, but they all pointed back to the same thing of the altar. And you look at Abram and you look at Lot and you tell me, well, that's a picture of the saved man and the lost man. But I want to come before you today and say that that's not true. If you study Second Peter chapter 2, it says that Lot was a righteous man. He vexed his righteous soul with the conversations of Sodom and Gomorrah. We're living in a time of Sodom and Gomorrah, amen? We're living in a time when Sodom and Gomorrah is wanting to get us, it's wanting to get our children, it's wanting to get our goods, it's wanting to get everything that we have and drag it down to Sodom. There is nothing greater for the devil to do than to destroy you and your family. There is nothing that the devil wants more than to pull you out of church. There is nothing that the devil wants more than to close the doors of a church that still preaches the old-fashioned way, that still preaches old-time religion, that still sings with conviction, that still that the Holy Spirit still moves upon. And the way the devil is doing it is through Christians neglecting their altars. It's the point in this. It, it, it is the point in this passage that we look later at the saints in the New Testament. And you can look it up. I've looked it up. I've studied. I've studied. I've never found, listen to me, a sin of an Old Testament saint in the New Testament. I've studied it through. I've read it, read it, read it. Hebrews talks about the, why doesn't it talk about Samson's sin? I don't understand it. Why don't it talk about Gideon's doubt? Why don't it talk about Abram's failure with the king of Egypt, failure with the king of Abimelech? It's because these men had an altar before God, and they were redeemed by God. They were redeemed from their failures. They were pulled back. They weren't let to go in and to completely fall out of God's will and God's way because they had a place to get back to. Even Samson, when he's standing there, and he kills more Philistines in the last day of his life than in his entire fighting career, the Bible says that he prayed unto to his Lord. He got down to a place where he said, I can no longer do this. You have to come back in and help me. Give me one more shot and I'll do it for you one more time. It's all about the altar. You see, we live in a modern day where we're blaming everything except what is actually happening. We blame our politicians. We blame our senators, our House of Representatives, State House, State Senate, whatever you want to do. We blame the mayor. We blame, blame the guy down the street. But here's my opinion on it. It's the true Bible-believing Christians that have left their altar that is destroying America. We neglect it. We neglect our scripture. We neglect the things that God put in our life. And no longer is there a brokenness on the altar. When is the last time? And it's just a question, folks. I'm not trying to get at anybody. But when is the last time that there's been a fast proclaimed in a church? When is the last time? That several churches have gotten together and gone through the night worshiping and praising and praying that God do something in their community. That's what brought it back in the day. That's why the Methodists were able to have revival is because there were some safe folks in the Methodist church that got down up under the altar and prayed till God moved on the church. But we live in a modern day and age where we're trying to, with gimmicks, gadgets, and everything under the sun, grow our church. And all we're doing is growing something for the devil. You think I'm wrong? Go down here and look at these big churches. Oh, they got all the they got all the gizmos and gadgets. But I'd much rather be in Lighthouse this morning. I'd much rather be in a small country church that knows what it's about than be up there with people that think they're worshiping God while they're putting on a show for the devil and drawing more people to hell than they ever drew to heaven. You look at it in the modern day and age in which we live. And folks, people my age have gone off in that mess. And they tell me, you know what? You're just living in the past. I'm okay with the past. I try not to live in the past. I try to live on my altar. 
And if my altar makes me seem old fashioned, I'm going to stay on the altar and I'm going to let the world revolve how it ever wants to revolve. I'm going to let whoever wants to step out, step out. I'm going to stay on my altar. I'm going to keep preaching. I'm going to keep serving. I'm going to keep looking for God to do something in my life. If nobody else wants God to do something with them, they'll step away from their altar and they'll grow it their own way. They'll grow it their own time. They'll grow it their own method. But those that want God to move truly and want the Holy Spirit's conviction to come amongst them and want people to get saved and want the church to grow with true Christianity, they will stay on their altar till God moves. They will give up food. They will give up technology. They will give up everything around them for a little while with God and say, God, until you move, I'm not going to get out of your presence. Until you bless, I'm not going to leave you. Until you touch my church, until you save my family, I am not going to get up off this altar. You ever wonder how much 40 days of fasting is with Moses? You ever wonder, and I'm not bragging on him, but you ever wonder why Brother Dean has so much power? I'll tell you another one that has so much power, and I hope y'all don't let the word out. I don't want him getting a big head. He's a good friend of mine. Brother Danny Markell. Wonder why he has so much power? That man stays on the altar. I want to preach for just a moment. And folks, I've been away seven years, so I have no clue what you're in or out of. I'm just preaching. I'm just preaching what the Lord gave me. But I want to preach on the evidence of your altar. I wonder what I wonder what kind of evidence. Evidence of your altars, or you can add it to it, or the lack thereof. It's a long title message. I don't really care. It's what the Lord gave me. We live in a time when there's a severe lack of evidence of altars in our churches. You ever you ever wondered why Brother John had such move of the Spirit on him? I've, I've stayed with him. I've heard him praying through the walls. It was an amazing thing. It was all fun and games once he was out and about. We were out picking together. We were out working together. We were out having a good time. But I'd hear him in the night season. I'd hear him in the early morning hours, and I'd be thinking, man, can he not just let me sleep a little bit more? Be in there. And I thought the first time that I ever heard him praying, I thought he was talking to somebody on the phone. I said, man, he woke me up. I bet he did it on purpose. I bet he's wanting me to come out. Went out into the living room, and I listened for a little bit, and I could hear the names of people being prayed over. I could hear the names of people being prayed over. I could hear the power being begged for. Oh, man, I've stayed with some of these guys, some of these old timers. There's an evidence of why they were such powerful men of God, and I want to show it with Abram and with Lot. You see Abram in chapter uh, 12 and chapter 13, he had his altars. I wonder what was the evidence of him having his altars. Look at Abram's greatness. Abram was great. Lot was greedy. You look at their two lives. Abraham was full of humility. Lot was full of pride. Pride and greed go hand in hand. Got to have a little more. Got to have a little more. Got to have a little more. Why? Because he's not on his altar. He has no altar to go back to. Why did he like it down in Egypt? He didn't, have, he didn't care about going back to the altar. If he'd have cared, he'd have built his own altar. He had no altar. When they came up out of Egypt, Abram asked him, hey, if you there in chapter 13, if you go to the south, I'll go to the north. If you go to the east, I'll go to the west. You pick. I don't want contention. What is the father of all contention? What is the beginning of all strife? It's pride. Oh, Lot, he was just greedy. The Bible says he lifted up his eyes and saw the well-watered plains of Jordan. You look at old Abram. Abram's a man's man. I can see Abram. I don't know why, but I picture him with a button down to here. Hairy chest. I don't know. He's just man's man. Big old tough dude walking around. He had to be. They're out there killing wolves. They're out there living in the wilderness and making flocks and herds survive. This is, I'd like to be around Abram. I wouldn't like to be around Lot. It's like, hmm, I wonder what's going on down in Sodom. You excuse me for a second, but I don't want to be around Sodom. There's some stuff going on in Sodom that Paul said was a shame for us to even mention. You see, old Abram, he's okay with being out in the desert. He's humble enough to be out in the desert. He's humble enough to be out on the backside of nowhere and just have his little flock and have his little herds and have his little sheep. But you look at old Lot and he's going, I'm going to go get something better. It's greener down there. My herds will grow. Just a little interesting side note because I love studying. I love, I love picking, out, picking out stuff out of Scripture. Interesting side note. Abram, you always see him with flocks, herds. You see him killing the fatted calf. You see, you, you just see greatness in Abram. 
When Lot gets down into Sodom, he gives up his tent, he gives up his flocks, and he gives up his herd. And he moves down into a hot house in Sodom. Why did he do it? He had no interest in doing what God had called Uncle Abram to do. He had no interest in being right with God. He gave up everything that God had gave him and moved in with the Sodomites. He was okay with it. Oh, he wasn't participating in their sin. The Bible says he was just vexed with their conversation. But can you imagine sitting there and listening to that mess? And he's okay with it. It's all right. What happened with Lot? He didn't have no altars. What happened with Abraham? He'd prefer his altar than men's applause. He'd prefer his altar and his little his little nook out in the middle of nowhere than for people to be going, that's the big man of God in this area. It's always impressive to me that these young guys that have thousands after them, you know who I'm talking about, preacher. Most of you know who I'm talking about. I don't name them because I don't want to give them no attention. But something that's amazing to them, a shepherd smells like sheep. They don't smell like sheep because they're down in Sodom. They don't have no altars because they're down in Sodom. They built stages. They built platforms. He's at the gate of Sodom set up. The Bible says he lifted his eyes. He looked. He lifted his eyes and looked at the well-watered plains of Sodom. He lifted his tent and moved down to Jordan. He looked. He inched. He got a little closer. But what was the evidence? What was it evidence of in his life? Lack of altar. Folks, you better listen to me this morning. You may think that you'll never like Sodom. You may think that you'll never like Gomorrah. You may never you may think that you'll never like the wickedness of this world. But there's still pleasure in sin for a season. And the only way that Abram kept from it was his altars. That's the only distinction between Lot and Abram. They had all the same things. But what made Abram great and what turned Lot into this just this greedy, sniveling weasel that ended up down in Sodom. He was just as great as Abram. He had everything that Abram had, but he was living off of Abram's greatness. I wonder, you listen to me now, I wonder how many young people are living off of their parents' greatness. I had a preacher one time tell me, you're riding your daddy's coattail. I said, yeah, that's why I'm 2,000 miles away from my dad, because I'm riding his coattails. That's why I'm That's why I'm where I'm at. You that are here today, especially the young people, listen to me. Your daddy's altar, your mama's altar ain't going to get you through. It's going to be your altar that gets you through. Abraham's daddy didn't have no altar. Abraham built his own altar. We're living in a time and place where our young people don't know which way to go, don't know which way to turn because the parents dropped the ball on their altar. I thank God for a daddy that would pray through the night. I thank God for a daddy that would fast and pray for his children. I thank God for a daddy that would fast and pray for the power of God. And he had his little altar in his little closet, and I could hear him praying over that thing. I thank God for that because that altar made my daddy great. Daddy's got over 70 churches now in Mexico. Papa started with five. A lot of people don't know that. Papa started with five. Dad started about 70. Why don't people know that? Because just like Abram, in all his greatness, he's humble. He's quiet about it. I hate the self-promotion that missions cause us today and age. It's not, it's not an evidence of an altar when somebody stands up and brags about what they've done. I've done this. I've done that. I've done the other. Tell everybody. I want everybody to know who I am. That's not evidence of the altar. That's evidence of the lack thereof. They've done things in their own power. And God is not in it. God is not on them because they don't have no altars in their life. Even that stone that Jacob laid his head upon, it became an altar where he fought for the blessings of God on that altar. He anointed that stone before he moved on. You look at scripture. It never tells us not to build altars. It never. The blood was shed. We don't have to sacrifice blood sacrifices anymore. But the altar wasn't given up. The altar has been offered up by Christians as a symbolic thing, as a thing of old. And we no longer use altars in our lives. Oh, we'll come down to the church and pray. But was that not what Lot did when he came up out of Egypt? He lived near Abraham's altar. I don't want to live near the altar. I want I want my tent to be set up where my altar is. 
I want wherever I go for there to be a new place where I go to the Lord and I say, this is your place where I'm going to come to you, God. And until you touch, until you move, I'm not going to leave you alone because I still believe that in this day and age we can have revival. I still believe that the drunk can get saved. I still believe that the harlot can get saved. I still believe that the bars can close down. I still believe that the casinos can close down. It's not a modern thing. It's a lack of altars. That the, church, that the church is losing ground in this world in which we live. It's about time that we see Abram's greatness and point out that the only thing that made Abram great was his God and the only thing that got him in contact with his God was his altars. You look at it and the evidence of his altars, Abram's greatness, slots greed. But the second, the second thing I like to notice, a little tongue tied there, be all right, I'll get out of it in a minute. <clears throat> second thing I like to notice, chapter 13, 14, 15, 17 and 18, and even in chapter 12, you see God's visitation on Abram. You never see that on Lot. You see a great void. Preacher, I wonder, I wonder, not as a church, but I wonder here this morning, how long has it been since you had a visitation? Lot got visited by God when he was at Uncle Abram's. But he never got visited in his own tent. He never got visited down in Sodom. I don't want God to move on my life because somebody else. I want God to move on me because I was laying on my face before him. I don't want the greatness for popularity's sake. I want God's approval. And God always shows his approval. You hear me? God always shows his approval through his visitation. But old Lot, all he had was a great void of understanding. See, Abram, he was looking around the next corner. Oh, I want to see God again. Oh, I want to see God again. I've heard so many old men of God pray that prayer. Oh, I just want to see you, God. Heard your daddy pray that prayer. Oh, God, I just want to see you down at the church. Heard my daddy pray that prayer. Oh, God, if you just visit us one more time. We can go on another mile. Oh, God, please just show up. Please just show up at my church. Please just show up on my house. God, if you'll show up, my children won't go to hell. God, if you'll show up, I can win one more for you. God, if you don't show up, all is vain. Then I might as well quit. You look at Lot, God never showed up in his life. There's just a great void of understanding. And you look at that old mountain man, that old force of nature, and God's visitation was on him through his entire ministry, through his entire life. I wonder, is it really? As some men have said it, I finally convinced Brother Dean that he was wrong. I finally did. Brother Dean would always say, there's not going to be a revival in the last day. The Lord's drawn his power off to Israel. And I'm going, Brother Dean, I refuse to believe that. I refuse I want one more revival. Wherever it's at, I'm going to go to it and I'm going to preach at least one time. I might die over where it's at. It might be Africa or something, you know, getting killed. I want one more. In our generation, I want revival. He always used to say that. He said the other night. He said, Lord's about to do something with these young people. There's going to be one more revival. I said, you've gone liberal. You've done listen to me. I wonder. I wonder why it's been years since in America. Decades since in America we've had revival. Don't get distracted by this liberal junk. That ain't revival. You ever study old Whitfield? You ever study uh, Edwards? You ever study these men? They weren't even Baptist. I'm okay with that. I, it kind of irks me a little bit. I'm Baptist born, Baptist bred, and when I die, I'll be Baptist dead. It irks me a little bit. But they had a true zeal and belief. That only God could change the land. It's what bred revival. It's what bred the revolution. It's what bred the nation that we're in today. It's because men got on their faces. When Jonathan Edwards preached sinners in the hands of an angry God, his seven deacons were under his altar, under his platform that he was standing on, begging God to do something in the church. The church had claw marks on its pews and claw marks on the pillars of the church where people were trying to keep from being dragged into hell. Don't we have that in the 
It's an evidence. It's an evidence in my own life that I'm not praying like those men did. It's an evidence in my own life that I haven't got to the point where I'm willing to risk everything, give everything, do everything so that God will visit me. And I've got to be careful because the only other option is a grateful one. You look at these two men, it's amazing. It's amazing to look at them, and it's amazing to see our modern day and culture. I have two reactions when I preach this, wherever I preach this. There's either a, uh, it's not commoving in English, there's either a movement on people's hearts, and there's a sad realization that we're in this spot where there's people just, yeah, yeah, you're right. And I want to believe that it's the movement that saddens us that's going to turn us to revival. Who cares if I do a good job this morning? What does it matter if lives aren't changed? What does it matter if we don't change the direction of our country? Can we do it? Yeah, we can. Do we want to do it? That's a whole different question. Folks, we see Abraham's greatness. We see Lot's greed. We see God's visitation. We see a great void. But number three, I like this one. We see Abram's gatherings. We see Lot's grief. What happened in chapter 14? You have, of those of you that have studied your Bible, you'll find chapter 14 starting out. Five kings came against seven. The five kings beat the seven that were aligned with Sodom and Gomorrah. And you find Lot. It says Lot, Abraham's nephew, being carried off with Sodom. Just a little bit of irony. You might want to splice this out of the message. Just a little bit of irony. What did those Sodomites fight with? I'm not trying to be facetious. I actually used it that right that time. I'm not trying to be facetious. But what on God's green earth did they use? They're Sodomites. They go out there with banners. You can't touch us. We've got our rights. I don't know. You're going to have to splice that out, preacher, and I'm okay with it. Oh, Lot. He's down there in chapter 14 getting carted off with the Sodomites. Where's Abram? Going before his men and saying, Men, we need to go get Lot. We need to go save Sodom because they've got my nephew amongst them. Can you imagine that that morning? Hey, Abraham, Lot was fighting against you. Why you want us to go get him? It's an amazing thing. Brother Dean pointed it out to me. It's an amazing thing that you won't fight against them. But when the devil comes to get them, you'll go fight for them. You won't hurt them. You won't hurt the sheep. When they're in your pews criticizing you, criticizing your wife, criticizing your babies. Great pain in your heart. But you'll let it slide because God's on you, because God's doing something, because you just want, you just want, God, just one more service and they might change. But you'll be the first number they call when they get down to the hospital. Old Abram, he's out there. It says that he could see Sodom and Gomorrah. I believe he saw it when they came in, when they fought. He saw the armies pillaging. He saw the fires. He saw them get taken off. He was always in a place where he could keep an eye on Lot, even though he had no responsibility to Lot. Lot had trashed everything that Abraham had given him. But notice, the gathering compared to the grief. What Lot have? Nothing but grief. Can you imagine as a daddy being carried off captive and your kids are with you? Why would you get carried off captive? Because I fought aligned with the Sodomites. I fought with the very people that are grieving my righteous soul. I fought for them, and I lost. Can you imagine having to face your daughter the next morning, Brother Jim? Why'd you lose? Because I got away from Uncle Abram. Why'd you lose? Because I got away from the altar. Oh, he didn't admit that. He just wallowed in his pity and his grief. How do we know it? Because he went back to Sodom when they came back from the Battle of the Kings. Oh, but I like old Abraham. He gathered, he walked in that morning to the tent. He said, boys, all you that been raised up in my house, I need y'all to come help me rescue Lot. <clears throat> I can see it. We're not going for Lot. Will you go for me? Oh, he was going to go gather up. 300 men grown up in his own house chased down five kings. Five kings that just beat seven kings. These aren't wimps. 
they're tough dudes, even though they beat Sodom. That's just a little side note. I don't know why that tickles me so, but it's hilarious. It's just a little side note. They beat the Sodomites. I mean, what, what can you do there? They chase them down, break up in three bands. And an old shepherd that has no experience in war, as far as we know, goes in and takes out and gathers to himself all the riches of this world. It's an amazing thing what happens next. He goes back to Sodom and the king goes, what's your take? What are you going to take out of all this that you beat? He said, I don't need it. I've already got everything I need. You hearing me this morning? When you've been on the altar, there'll be some needy times come along. There'll be some hard times. And the world will tell you, here's your fix. We'll give you everything you want. And everyone said, I don't want no part of it because it's been tainted with Sodom. <coughs> been tainted with Gomorrah. Why do I want the world in my home? Why do I want the world in my children? He said, no, 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 no. What I've won, I'm giving my tithe to the Lord. The rest of it can burn with Sodom. I wonder if by that point he was already having an inkling of a clue of what God was about to do to Sodom. That conversation is a little bit different if you study it in its context. It says that God told him what he was going to do to Sodom. But Abram had great foresight in several scriptures. You'll see it. God was always with him. And he always gathered. He never needed nothing from this world. An evidence of your altar or of the lack thereof is how much you need this whole world. Folks, as I get closer and closer to God, I get happier and happier about my leaving. As I get further and further away from God, I get happier about the things around me. And I find when I'm more time on my phone, when I've spent more time on my television, when I've spent more time on YouTube, I find that I start liking the things of this world more and more. It's an evidence of my lack of altar. But when I get over on the altar and start remembering the glimpses of Calvary that I've seen, and start remembering the glimpses of hell that I've seen. It drives me to gather those around me. It drives me to pull them back in. Oh, I know they've been down in Sodom, but it's all right. I know they've been down in Gomorrah, but I will save them anyways. If the Lord will give me strength. I wonder, you having gathering this morning? Or you having nothing but grief? I notice it's nothing about worldly goods. He gave it all up. Ten percent went to the king of Salem. And killed to death. Ninety percent went back to Sodom. He did, he did not care that it burned up in Sodom. He did not care if they came back and took it again. He'd go do it again. But he wasn't going to have anything to do with this world. I wonder how many of us are gatherers. I wonder how many of us are grievers. I've been able to get it over my past failures on the altar. Same altar that I got saved on was the same altar that later was a place that I could go back to and say, God, I met you here inside my mama's bed down there in Mexico. I met you here, God. I'd like to see you again. I'd like to talk to you again. I'd like to know that I'm back in good with you. I want to gather up. I don't want grief. My grief was given on the altar, and I've been able to gather again because of getting back on the altar. Last thing I want to notice, and we're finishing up, folks. I love it. You see Abram's generations, you see Lot's guilt. So David, you and your girls here this morning is an evidence of your daddy's altar. All those churches in Mexico are an evidence of my daddy's altar. I'm an evidence of my daddy's altar. I remember walking in one night and hearing my daddy on the altar. Lord, if he's going to stay in the world. I'm okay with you killing him. Love me so much, he was willing to give me up. There's several generations here that are evidence of Brother John being salted. There's evidence in Panama of my daddy and granddad's altars. What happens after it is going to be evidence of mine. But what's happened up to this point is evidence of greater men that went before us. You think about it. When did Isaac become Abraham? When did Jacob become Isaac? 
When did Moses take the place of Jacob as the leader of all Israel? A million and a half people. When did Joshua take over his job? You look at it, preacher. It was always on or around either a real physical or a symbolic altar. Look at Joshua bowing before the angel that appeared unto him. Look at Elisha over there at the bottom of the whirlwind. God of Elijah rips the mantle. Symbolic altar right there. You look at it. There was never a man given greatness and given generations after him until he got his altar right. This world has confused us to think that we need numbers. And folks, when I talk about the numbers that we do have, don't get confused. I'm just giving y'all an update because y'all invest in us. It's, it's a necessary evil. But far be it from me to brag on those numbers. Because it's not about the numbers. It's about the generations to follow. And I look, I look at what we're doing with the Indians. I look at what we're doing amongst the Latins. I look at what God's doing in our life. It's evidence of men that went before me and showed me the way, cleared out the path with the altars that they had. I've got to build my own altar. And I love doing it. People look at me like a uh, like a flaming weirdo. What is he doing? I'm out there stalking one rock upon another. They'll be walking their little trails. Me and old Brother Jovi will get down. Lord, give us this village. They won't let us speak yet, but Lord, give us this village. We walked out above villages, built little altars out of the volcanic rock. Said, Lord, give us this village. Just like over in Deuteronomy, every place that your foot treadeth will be yours. Lord, give us this little village. Lord, if there's something going on here, help us bust it up. This time that Brother Danny Markell came down. This was a month ago, two months ago, in June, that Brother Danny Markell came down. We broke down. What a pleasant way to start a missionary trip. We broke down out in the mountains. Our clutch went out, the clutch bearing went out, and we couldn't go on. And I said, guys, if y'all are willing to, we'll go ahead and walk in. They had all come prepared to walk, so why not walk? We just had to walk a little bit further. We got down in there, down into the first place where we meet them. They walk six hours to get down to preach so that we can preach to them. You talk about that they get upset when we don't preach long enough. It's because they walk six hours to come to a service. They get me preaching twice a month. Now Brother Elmer preaches a whole lot more to them. They don't get quite as upset now as they used to. Uh, that's all the Lord had for today. Oh, we don't care. Give us some more. Find something else. Tell the Lord we need more. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm tired, but yeah, we'll go another round. It's all right. Got out there with Brother Danny, Brother Adam, Brother John Michael Henderson. They were down there with us. We met the people at the cross, and we got a bus to take us. Or no, we got a car. I was doing this, and when it didn't work, I did this. And they stopped. They asked, what did you do? I rubbed my fingers together. That's all I had to do. It worked. They got stopped. <clears throat> we got in the back of that truck, went down, met the first crew. They said, Pastor, a bus is about to come through. There's a little bridge right up here. We can meet under that bridge and not be wet. Down there, it's rainy season year round in the, in the reservation. That's why it's jungle. That's why it's rainforest. So we go down to that bridge, get on this bus, go down to that bridge, get all these kids on the bus, get all these women on the bus, get the young men that are preaching out there on the bus. I mean, we're hanging off of every side, everything we could do to get all our people out there. And then one of the boys takes off and goes gets the other, the, the other uh, uh, village, the other tribe that comes to our services. Went to get them to let them know what had happened while we weren't able to drive up there. I'd say we, we met that day mostly kids, but about 40 people. The mamas were there. That's our goal. We win the mamas. It's off the market for them. And so we're excited about it. We're trying to win those mamas. They get up under there. Brother Danny preached that first night, one in the morning. I was getting exhausted. I was like, Brother Danny, you want to give up anytime? I'm good with it. I'm having to translate all this, and I'm kind of sleepy. But we let him preach anyways. About one in the morning, we gave up, went to sleep. We had to leave our tent. We just laid on the side of the, side of the bridge to make sure we weren't out where the rain would hit us. Brother Danny, Brother Adam, Brother John Henderson, um, in a tent. 
and all the Indians slept in a circle on the other side of the bridge, just kind of accountability sake, them over there, us over here for the women's sake. That next morning we got up. I said, all right, everybody. The Lord's put on my heart that we need to build an altar up under here. Y'all go down to that river. That's the river where Brother Dean came down. I said, y'all go down to that river and get a rock and bring it back up. Little bitty kid, big old rock on my shoulder. Lord put it on my heart. Those generations. I can just see it. If the Lord tarries is coming. Ooh. I can just see little Leo walking with his kids and grandkids by that place. We gotta go. We gotta go fix up this place. What is it, Daddy? Just a mound of rocks. No. This is the altar where God met us and I got saved. This is the altar where your grandma got saved and I was no longer sold on the black market of slavery. This is the place. It was a time long ago. This crazy man came out and he said, build up an altar. I can see it now, preacher. I can see him stopping off at that place, going down under that bridge and praying. I heard their prayers on that altar. I heard them asking God to get them out of their situations. I heard them asking God to save their parents. I heard them asking God to save those that had hurt them. That old altar is going to be there for generations to come. That's why I believe it was out of stone. Stone doesn't destroy. Even fire doesn't destroy stone. It may break it, but it never destroys it. I wonder. I wonder how many generations will come by that altar and say, I don't have to live in daddy and mama's guilt. Because some old-fashioned preacher came down and built an altar. You better believe me this morning that the only difference between Abram and Lot was their altars. Genesis 19. Lot's living in Sodom. Lot's become the judge of Sodom. They say, how's this man come to judge us? Lot offers up his daughters to Sodom. Lot has, through his daughters, the two greatest enemies of Israel, two greatest enemies to the child of God. I believe with all my heart, studying out scripture, the only reason the sin of sodomy survived is because of Lot. He asked for Zoar to be saved, and he ran to Zoar. And then he didn't even stay in Zoar. He went up to a cave and failed miserably. Lived the rest of his life not being able to look his daughters in the eye. Lived the rest of his life not being able to look his grandchildren in the eye. Where was Abram in all this? Still being great. Still having God's visitation. Still having a gathering. Still having generations. Even after Isaac, even after Ishmael, he still had generations. Through a post-Sarah marriage. I wonder this morning. I wonder. What's the evidence in your life? Are you eat up with greed? Are you eat up with a great void? Are you eat up with grief, guilt? Or are you like old Abram? Maybe not everybody knows you, but God knows you. And God's doing something great in your life. If you're not at that point, why don't you get back to an old-fashioned altar? Why don't you get home this afternoon? And if it's a board piece of stone take something take it into your secret place and tell God this is the place I'm going to visit with you when I'm struggling this is going to be the place that I'm going to visit you when I make mistakes why is it so important if you're not intentional about your prayer life you ain't going to have no prayer life you must purpose to put some altars in your life 